J.D. Harrington, Public Affairs Officer for NASA's Astrophysics Division in Washington, D.C. I'd like to welcome you to today's media teleconference where we will discuss new discoveries from NASA's planet hunting mission, the Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler is NASA's first mission capable of finding Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone. That's the range of distance from a star where the surface temperature of an orbiting planet might be suitable for liquid water. Kepler was launched in March of 2009 and has detected planets and planet candidates with a wide range of sizes and orbital distances that is helping us to better understand our place in the galaxy. Before we begin, a few topics to discuss. We have four panelists joining us today, and you can find the graphics the panelists will use by going to www.nasa.gov slash Kepler and clicking on the link in the top right corner. Now, each panelist will give a short three- to five-minute briefing, and once finished, we'll then move on to the question-and-answer session, accepting questions from media that dialed into the telephone bridge and those folks that submitted questions via Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Once again, the graphics can be found by going to www.nasa.gov slash Kepler and clicking on the link in the top right corner. This media telecon will be limited to one hour. Today's panelists include Doug Hudgens, NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program Scientist at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Elisa Quintana, a research scientist at the SETI Institute at NASA's Ames Research Center in Moffett Field, California. Tom Barclay, a research scientist at the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute at Ames. And Victoria Meadows, professor of astronomy at the University of Washington in Seattle and principal investigator for the Virtual Planetary Laboratory, a team in the NASA, NASA Astrobiology Institute at Ames. And with that, we'll get started. Doug? Thank you, J.D. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Hudgens. I am the program scientist for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program. I'm thrilled to be here today for the announcement of the latest results from the Kepler mission, the cornerstone mission for the Exoplanet Exploration Program and NASA's first mission designed to search for planets around other stars. Can we go ahead to the first slide, please? As is now clear to everyone, I think, the Kepler mission has revolutionized the field of exoplanet exploration, single-handedly doubling the number of known planets outside our own solar system. And the hits just keep on coming. It was only about a year ago that we announced the first super-Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of another star, Kepler-62f, a planet about 40% larger than the Earth, orbiting a star slightly cooler than the Sun. Only a few weeks ago, we announced the validation of literally hundreds of new exoplanets. Today, we're here to announce yet another major milestone for the Kepler mission and the dedicated scientists who are engaged in the painstaking analysis of Kepler data, the discovery of the first truly Earth-sized habitable zone exoplanet. Next slide. This new result is based on continued analysis of data that was gathered during Kepler's first four-plus years of operation between March of 2009 and May of 2013. During that time, Kepler continuously monitored around 160,000 stars in a single field of view, straddling the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. Uh, next slide, please. Remember that the Kepler uh, mission uses the transit technique to find exoplanets. Uh, that is, it's designed to measure the tiny dimming of a star that occurs when a planet's orbit causes it to pass in front of or transit that star. To date, analysis of the data from just the first three years of those observations has revealed more than 3,800 exoplanet candidates, that is, stars that exhibit the telltale dimming characteristic of a planet transit, and more than 950 of those have subsequently been validated as actual planets and not false positive signals. The results you're going to hear about in the next few minutes are exciting and important for several reasons. First, this is the first validated detection of an Earth-sized planet orbiting in the habitable zone of its parent star, a cool red dwarf. Second, this discovery establishes that Earth-sized planets can and do exist in the habitable zones of other stars. Third, red dwarf stars, like the uh, parent of the planet you'll hear about today, are by far the most abundant stars in our galaxy, making up about 80% of the nearest stars to the Earth. Thus, 
Planets such as this one are almost certainly the most common type of habitable planet in our galaxy and may very well represent the closest habitable planets to Earth. Finally, today's results represent another important step toward the ultimate goal of the Kepler mission, to determine the abundance of habitable Earth-sized planets in our galaxy. Can we have the next slide? Looking to the future of exoplanet exploration, our next exoplanet mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, is planned to launch in 2017 and will survey the whole sky, searching for transiting exoplanets among the stars in the solar neighborhood, many of which will be red dwarfs. So today's result only makes the prospects for future test discoveries all the more exciting. Our next great observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, is scheduled to launch in 2018 and will be ideally suited to measure the spectra of transiting exoplanets orbiting red dwarfs. If we're fortunate enough that one of these red dwarfs, or one of the red dwarfs in our galactic backyard, harbors a transiting Earth-sized exoplanet in the habitable zone, JWST may very well be able to study its atmosphere, looking for signs of composition, climate, weather, and habitability. So, as I think you can see, for this is, these are exciting times for the field of exoplanet exploration. And with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Quintana. Uh, before you start, uh, Elisa, this is uh, J.D. I wanted to tell everyone that's uh, listening, uh, evidently we're having some problems with our graphics page. Uh, on the Kepler website, on the top right corner, there is a link to the Ustream uh, link. Uh, that should be able to take you to the graphics that are running via video, so you'll be able to see them there while we work out this minor uh, technicality. Uh, uh, Dr. Quintana, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So my name is Elisa Quintana. I'm a research scientist with the SETI Institute and NASA Ames Research Center, and I'm the lead author of this work. So one of the goals of the Kepler mission is to find other planets like our own, um, those that are both Earth-sized and orbit within their star's habitable zone. So this is the region around a star within which a planet can sustain liquid water on its surface. Uh, next slide, please. So in this quest, several key milestones have been reached. Um, Kepler 20e is one of several Earth-sized planets found by Kepler. Um, these planets all reside extremely close to their stars, however, so they're far too hot to support life. Next slide, please. Kepler 22b is among dozens of planets found to orbit within their star's habitable zone. Um, these planets are all larger than Earth, and so we now know that planets like Kepler 22b are most likely too large to have a rocky composition. Next slide. So now we know of planets that are Earth-sized but orbit too close to their star to be habitable, and we know of planets that orbit at just the right distance but are too large. So today I would like to share our discovery of a planet that has both the right size and is at the right distance to allow the existence of liquid water on its surface. Next slide. So on behalf of the SETI Institute, um, the NASA Kepler team, and many other collaborators. I present to you Kepler 186f. This is the first validated Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of another star. So here we show an artist's concept of what this planet uh, could look like. So we can now say that other potentially habitable worlds similar in size to our Earth can exist, and it's no longer in the realm of science fiction. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'll tell you about what we know about the system that this planet resides in. Um, here you can see a top-down view of the Kepler-186 system, which harbors five planets. The star is at the center of the illustration, and the white circular streaks uh, represent the orbits of the planets. Kepler-186f is shown to orbit in this green region, which represents the star's habitable zone. So Kepler-186f is an M dwarf that is smaller and cooler than, than our sun, and this whole system is at about 500 light years away from Earth. So the five planets are known um, to orbit the star, and they all have sizes that are less than one and a half times the size of Earth. Um, the, four, the inner four planets orbit really close to their stars. They have orb orbital periods between four and 23 days. 
So Kepler 186f is the outermost planet. It has a size that is within 10% of the size of Earth. It orbits its star every 130 days. So at this orbital distance, it receives about one third of the stellar heat that Earth receives from the sun. So this places the planet near the cooler edge of the star's habitable zone. So now let's start the animation. So he, again, you can see all of the five planets orbiting. Um, Kepler 186f is shown in the green region. And now we're zooming in towards the inner four planets. And now we'll take a side view while we zoom past the inner four plan planets. And now we're zooming towards Kepler 186f. And now we swing around the planet. And you'll see the um, Kepler-186 come back into view with the inner four planets transiting. And you can see the um, uh, Kepler-186F uh, illuminated by the orange light from the M dwarf. Um, next slide. So now let's take a look at what this planet could be made of. So Kepler measures a planet's size. It doesn't measure its mass, so we don't know its composition. We can still place constraints on the composition from theoretical models and from observations of other small bodies. So thermal evolution models predict that planets as small as Kepler 186f are unlikely to be dominated by these thick gas envelopes that you see in Neptune and Jupiter, um, those which don't have a solid surface. From the dozens of small planets known to orbit close to their star that have both measured masses and measured sizes, we can deduce that planets of Earth's size are likely to be rocky. Um, in our own solar system, we don't have any planets in between the size of Earth and Neptune. Um, Neptune is four times larger than the Earth. Uh, the Earth and all of the smaller bodies in our so solar system are primarily composed of iron and rock and water and ice, as, as you can see below. Um, Earth, exam for example, has a, an iron-dense core and a rocky exterior with some water and ice in the mantle and crust. So given theoretical models and what we observe in our solar system, um, it's likely that uh, the planets that are the size of Earth, like Kepler-186f, are also composed of some proportion of, of iron, rock, and ice. Next slide. So why do we search for planets that are like Earth? Um, are, these, are planets of the size really all that different from these so-called super-Earths that are more than 40% larger than Earth and that also orbit in their star's habitable zone? Well, Earth is the only planet that we know of that has the right conditions to allow life to thrive. We have tangi tangible evidence about the Earth. We know the Earth is special because it had the right size and temperature to allow the formation of a core and a mantle and a crust and all of these layers that are essential for having an atmosphere and the existence of oceans and plate, te plate tectonics. Um, we don't have super-Earths in our solar system, so we simply don't know if those larger planets um, can develop conditions that are suitable for life. Next slide, please. Kepler 186f is now the planet closest in size to Earth that orbits in the, in the habitable zone of, of its star. Uh, Kepler 186f is special because we already know that a planet of this size and in, and in the habitable zone is capable of supporting life as we know it. Uh, next slide. So to summarize, Kepler 186f is the first validated Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of another star. It has the right size and is at the right distance to have properties similar to our home planet. This discovery confirms that Earth-sized planets do exist in the habitable zones of other stars. So before I hand it off to Dr. Barclay, I'd just like to take a few minutes to um, express my gratitude to the team. Um, I came to NASA Ames about 14 years ago as a graduate student. Um, I started working with Bill Brookie on the Vulcan project at Lick Observatory, which was a precursor to Kepler. Um, while I was there, Kepler just, uh, consisted of a technology demonstration in, in the basement of our building. Um, 
so I've so I've been able to have this u- unique ex- experience to see all of the stages, and as um, Kepler has, pro- has progressed from, um, you know, fi- getting funding and being built, and um, I was able to see the witness the launch and participate in many of the exciting discoveries. So, it's it's been really an honor for me to be here to share this latest discovery. Um, and with that, I will hand it to Dr. Barclay. He will tell us about M dwarfs and why we should be searching for more pl- Earth-sized planets around these types of stars. Uh, this is J.D. once again before you start, Tom. Uh, I'm told that the graphics are now up on the main page, so uh, for those that are uh, listening in, if you go back to the, if you uh, recycle back to the uh, Kepler main page, you can find the press kit and the graphics links there that everyone's talking to. Sorry for the uh, inconvenience. Tom, back to you. No problem. Thanks, J.D. Um, that's right. So my name's Tom Barclay. Um, I'm a research scientist at the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute, and I'm based at NASA's Ames Research Center. I'm a co-author on this study that we're presenting today, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the types of stars that this, include the star that this planet orbits, M dwarfs, why they're interesting, and why we should care about planets that orbit these cooler stars. Next slide, please. So here we show the Sun. The Sun is known as a G dwarf, and Kepler-186 which is an M dwarf. M dwarfs are smaller, cooler, and dimmer than our own star. They range in size from about 10% of the size of the Sun to about half the size of the Sun. Kepler-186 here is on the larger end of the scale, being about half the size of the Sun. Next slide, please. So this size difference helps us find planets. M M dwarfs are great targets to search for habitable worlds. Here we show, on the lower panel, the, what we observe from Kepler. So we observe, as Doug discussed, transits, when a planet passes in front of the star. So the larger the star, the shallower the transit, because what we measure is the ratio between the size of the planet and the size of the star. So you shrink the star, you get a deeper transit. Deeper transits are easier to detect. So we find it easier to detect smaller planets around these smaller stars. Next slide, please. M dwarfs are also significantly less luminous than our own sun. So their habitable zones are located much closer in. Here we show a schematic diagram. See on the left, Earth and Kepler-186, very similar in size. On the lower part, we show the solar system, with Earth in the habitable zone, and Venus and Mercury slightly interior. Above that, we show the Kepler-186 system. You see the habitable zone is much closer in. This is because the star is cooler. So in a given space of time, Kepler-186 will exhibit more transits. It will go around its star more times than Earth would. Kepler-186f goes around its star every 130 days. Earth goes around its star every 365 days. So in the four-year duration of the Kepler mission, we could see more transits of Kepler-186f than we could see for an Earth analogue. So this combination of deeper transits and more common transits makes habitable planets, habitable zone planets uh, around M dwarfs significantly easier to detect. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Well, here's the plot showing the distance from a star increasing to the right and the temperature of a star going from cold to hot as the plot goes upwards. The green region here is the habitable zone, it's the the distance from a star where a planet could host liquid water given the right atmosphere. The solar system planets are shown at the top around a sun-like star with Earth nicely in the habitable zone there. And the Kepler-186 system below that with Kepler-186f in the habitable zone. You see Kepler-186f is much closer in. This is a logarithmic plot so, it's, so it allows us to see everything on the same scale. But actually, Kepler-186f orbits at a similar distance to Mercury. Although Kepler-186f therefore has many similarities to Earth in terms of size and occupancy in the habitable zone, they orbit very different stars. Kepler-186f, then, is perhaps more of an Earth cousin than an Earth twin. It has similar characteristics to the Earth, but a different parent. Next slide, please. So M dwarfs are fantastic places to look for planets, and this is because they're, most, they're the most abundant stars in our galaxy. 
There are a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, and seven out of every ten of them are M dwarfs. This means that most Earth sized planets in their habitable zones will be around M dwarfs simply because most stars are M dwarfs. They're also our nearest neighbours. Most of the nearest by stars to us are M dwarfs. Now, when you go out into your backyard and look at the sky, you won't see any M dwarfs. They're very faint. We can't see any of them with our, with our naked eyes. However, they are there. They're the most common things around us nearby. And NASA is actually building a mission to search for transiting planets orbiting the, most, the nearest by stars. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite TESS. And many of the targets it's going to find planets around will be cooler stars such as this. Next slide, please. Now, just because a planet is in the habitable zone, it doesn't mean it's habitable. We know the size of Kepler-186f, we know the distance it is from the star, we can deduce how much energy it receives from its star. But we haven't mentioned anything about the temperature of this planet. And that's for a very good reason. A temperature of a planet is strongly dependent on the kind of atmosphere surrounding a planet. Our own planet is surrounded by an atmosphere that blankets the planet and keeps us warm. There's a greenhouse effect and it warms us up. Well, the same is going to be true of uh, Kepler-186f. We don't know if it has an atmosphere. If it does have an atmosphere, it'll have a warming effect. But it depends on the kind of atmosphere, how much of a warming effect it'll have. Is there gr enough greenhouse gases to warm it up? Well, fortunately, in the next few years, NASA will be launching a mission to try and understand the atmospheres of other worlds, particularly those worlds found by TESS. That's, this mission is JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, and many of the atmospheres it's going to try and target will be around cooler M dwarf stars such as this. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, Kepler-186f demonstrates that Earth-sized planets exist in the habitable zones of other stars. Kepler-186f orbits a cooler star than the Sun, so it's perhaps more like Earth's cousin than Earth's twin. M-dwarfs are fantastically compelling targets to search for Earth-sized worlds in the habitable zone, because they're the most abundant stars, they're our nearest neighbours. And that's why we're building future missions to try and characterise the planets orbiting these types of stars. And with that, I'd like to hand off to uh, Professor Meadows, who's going to tell you, talk to you next. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Tom. Okay, so hi, my name is uh, Victoria Meadows. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrobiology at the University of Washington and also the lead scientist for the Virtual Planetary Laboratory team of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. First slide. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the significance of this discovery for the search for life beyond our solar system and to describe some of the factors that might affect the habitability of Kepler-186f. As Tom mentioned in his presentation, M dwarf planets may be the most common type of habitable world in the galaxy. Next slide. But what makes these worlds particularly interesting is that an M dwarf planet's interaction with its star is likely to be very different from the Earth's interaction with the Sun. And so the environments of these Earth cousins may be very different. Next slide. This is largely because an M dwarf is cooler and less bright than the Sun, and the habitable zone is much closer to the star. Next slide. Because the habitable zone is closer, the star's gravity, as well as its radiation, can impact the planet's habitability. The star's gravity can subject the planet to tidal locking, which can eventually lead to synchronous rotation, where the planet always shows the same face to the star, much like our moon shows the same face to the Earth. Other possible effects of the gravitational interaction between planet and star include heating of the planetary interior, and in extreme cases, even the loss of an ocean. Kepler-186f, though, is around a relatively hot and large M dwarf star for these normally small and cool stars. And it's also further out in its habitable zone. Consequently, tidal heating on this planet is likely to be negligible, and the planet may not even be tidally locked if it formed with a fast rotation. Some of you may have also have heard that flares can potentially threaten a planet orbiting an M dwarf. But Kepler-186f orbits an older and quieter M dwarf they still have flares, but not giant flares, and not a lot of them, a bit like our sun. Next slide. But the star's light spectrum is not at all like the sun's. Instead, it has shifted more towards infrared radiation, 
and this changes how an Earth-like planet interacts with the star's light. For example, the dominant radiation we receive from our star, the Sun, is at visible wavelengths, sunlight. At these wavelengths, ice is reflective, and the atmosphere is largely transparent except for blue light from our star, which is more strongly scattered away. But for an Earth-like planet orbiting an M-dwarf, the incoming near-infrared radiation is absorbed by ice rather than reflected. There's little or no blue light coming from the star to scatter away, and gases in the atmosphere like water vapor and carbon dioxide absorb and trap incoming infrared radiation. Next slide. This makes the planet more efficient at absorbing energy from its star to avoid freezing over, which is why this planet is still considered potentially habitable as long as it has a dense enough atmosphere, even though it receives less light from its star than Mars does from our sun. We can see this illustrated in this diagram, which shows a different way of looking at the habitable zone. This plot shows a fraction of light received by the planet from its star relative to the light that Earth receives from the sun. The sloped vertical lines show a conservative version of the habitable zone, which Kepler-186f sits within in the lower right of this diagram. These blue habitable zone lines curve to the right for the redder M-dwarf stars, indicating that less light from the star is needed to keep the planet warm. This is because the larger fraction of infrared radiation coming from an M-dwarf star is more readily observed by an Earth-like planet's surface and atmosphere. Next slide. Finally, it's fun to note that if the planet is habitable, photosynthesis may be possible. Kepler-186f still likely receives about a sixth of the light at wavelengths that plants use for photosynthesis. There are Earth plants that would be quite happy with that. Next slide. So in summary, Kepler-186f is the first confirmed Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. M-dwarf planets interact differently with their parent star, and so their environments are affected by different factors and may be quite different. The interesting thing, though, is that the majority of environments for life in the universe might orbit M-dwarfs, our, our cousins, our cousin planets. And finally, planets like this one, albeit discovered much closer nearby by the test mission and characterized by the James Webb Space Telescope, will likely provide our first opportunity to search for life beyond the solar system. And with that, I'll thank everyone for listening, and back to you, J.D. Thanks, Victoria. And with that, we'll start the question and answer session. We have several reporters on the telephone bridge today, quite a few, as a matter of fact. As such, we'll need to limit everyone to one question with one follow-up. Once everyone has had a chance to ask a question, and if time permits, we'll start from the beginning again. And just for information, we have quite a few good questions that are on the Ask Twitter uh, feed as well. Our operator... Millicent should identify you, but if she doesn't, I ask that you identify yourself, your media affiliation, and then direct your question to a specific panelist if possible to eliminate any confusion. For those dialing in, push the star one keys on your telephone to be placed in the queue. To use Twitter, send your questions to hashtag AskNASA. And with that, we'll begin. Millicent? Thank you, sir. At this time, lines are open for questions and answers. As Mr. Harrington has stated, you may dial star 1 to ask a question. Please make sure that your line is not muted and record your first and last name clearly when prompted so that I may introduce your question. One moment, please, while our first question arrives. Today's first question comes from Mr. David Perlman of the San Francisco Chronicle. Your line is now open. Okay, thanks. Uh, Professor Meadows, everybody's going to ask the same question. I suspect, and that is, given the habitability question of M dwarf of planets around M, M dwarf stars, has anybody ever calculated the possibility of finding life on such a planet, including 186F? I'm not sure what you mean by calculated the possibility. Um, do you do you mean have we looked into this question of whether or not M dwarf planets can be habitable? Well, yes, and then the possibility that uh, somewhere, sometime, there has been or is life on oh, okay. such planets. Well, well, certainly there, there's um, there's no uh, good reason at the moment why M dwarf planets could not be habitable. So yes, we we do consider them to be perfectly um, perfectly viable uh, potential places for habitability. 
They do have to have um, a certain number of uh, things going for them. So we don't have, you know, any definitive detection yet of something where we can say, yes, that's habitable. But what we can certainly do is say that there are factors that affect habitability. Um, this particular planet, for example, the fact that it is, is small uh, really increases its chance of being rocky, and so therefore that increases its probability uh, of being habitable and being able to support a liquid um, water uh, ocean. But I would definitely say that M-dwarf planets uh, could be just as habitable as the Earth. Uh, it all depends on their characteristics and, again, how they interact with the star. But the problems I discussed about flaring, all those sorts of things, uh, we do know there, there are ways around there that those ways the planet can be protected. And so, yeah, M-dwarf planets could, could definitely be habitable. I have no follow-up. Thanks. Our next question is from Mr. Ian Thompson of The Register. Your line is now open. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for um, Meadows. If I, if I, I'm just trying to get my head around the, the differences in light quality that uh, this planet is showing. You're saying it, it's getting about a third of the light um, that we would get from our sun, but it's still perfectly habitable for plants. How exactly does that work? Um, well, plants, plants uh, I'm not a photosynthesis expert, but I'll answer this as best, best as I can. Plants are looking at, so the total amount of radiation they get within the, the so-called photosynthetically active region uh, of the spectrum. And this M dwarf star, because it's a relatively hot one, uh, it still has about half of the total flux of radiation coming out at visible wavelengths. It is shifted towards the red, but there still is visible um, light coming out. So you're going to get um, essentially a, a reduced amount of light um, on the surface of the planet, but we have shade planets that live under the canopy of rainforests and so forth that, that routinely um, manage to photosynthesize even in those sorts of light levels. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question is from Mr. Mike Wall of Space.com. Okay, hi. Thanks, guys. Um, this is probably another one for Victoria. Could you talk about maybe yeah, how strong would the gravity be on this planet? I mean, that all depends upon the composition, which we're not entirely sure of at the moment, but, but could you make a guess based on its its size? I mean, if like if we were transported there, would we feel heavier? Would it be about the same as it is here on Earth, or what? Uh, okay, I mean, other people on the panel can answer that one too, but, but we don't know the density of the object. We, we don't know what it's made of. It, it could be, as we said, anything from solid iron all the way through to, to uh, sort of an icy composition. It is probably most likely uh, rocky, though. Uh, and so uh, in that case, since it's, it's um, a larger radius, if it's exactly the same density as the Earth, it has more mass, and so there would be slightly more gravity. You would feel heavier. Uh, this is JD. Uh, I'm going to chime in with a, with a Twitter question real quick. This is from Kelly Quentrail. Uh, when and how will we be able to see the chemical composition and thickness of the atmosphere of Kepler-186F, or can we already? Uh, I can chime in here. This is Tom Barkley. Um, no, we, we don't know essentially anything about the atmosphere of this planet, even if, if indeed it has one. And we're probably not likely to learn about this planet's atmosphere anytime soon, and that's because this planet's fairly far away and the star is relatively faint. This is the reason why NASA is launching the mission TESS to find planets similar to this one perhaps, but closer by, orbiting brighter stars, and it's launching the James Webb Space Telescope, which one of its goals will be to try and measure the chemical composition of some atmospheres, particularly planets orbiting cool stars like this one. Today's next question comes from Mr. Jason Major of Universe Today. Your line is now open. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Um, this is for Tom or Victoria. Um, I'm just wondering what the, uh, what the age of the Kepler-186 system is thought to be and potentially even the, the uh, planet 186F itself. Uh, obviously, you know, the evolution of life uh, on a planet, even if it is ha habitable, takes time. So what type of time spans are we talking about? Yeah, I, I can jump in there with this one. This one's nice because it's stellar astrophysics. Um, so M dwarfs are very hard to tell the ages of. Um, they take a long time to form, maybe a few hundred million years, maybe up to a billion years to form. But once they're formed, they don't change too much over their lifespan. Maybe their rotation rate slows down, they might flare less, they might become less active. 
But unlike our, our, star, our star, which changes its chemical composition in size internally over time and in increases in size a little bit, M dwarfs essentially stay the same size their entire lifetime, much, much longer than the age of the universe. So in the age of our universe, M dwarfs have hardly changed since they formed. And that makes it very, very difficult to tell how old an M dwarf is. This is a, bit, a big problem. Um, so we know it's probably older than a few billion years because it's, it's a slow rotator, it's fairly quiet, um, it's definitely formed. Um, but other than that, we don't really know. It could be anything from a couple of billion to you know, 12 billion. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Mr. Edward Downs of InFlight USA magazine. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think Mr. Hudgens might be able to answer this. Just clarification, is the data that has been studied to discover this planet based on previous observations, uh, data that's been gathered, or is this a new observation? This is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I can answer this, or, or uh, actually, uh, why don't I let Elisa uh, uh, answer this, because I think she can uh, take it just as well. Okay, sure. Um, so the inner four planets of the system were detected very early on, um, within the first four months of data. Um, so we knew about um, those planets, and those were just recently validated. Um, if you remember a few weeks ago, there was a big batch of, of planets that were validated um, by Jason Rowe um, from the SETI Institute. Um, the, this, uh, the inner four planets to, to this system were in that batch. Um, so that study used um, the first two years to validate uh, the inner four planets. And um, t um, it took an additional year of data in order to find the signal for Kepler-186f. And then once we found the signal, which was around last spring, um, it took an additional year to, to go through the process of characterizing the star and validating the data. We had to get high contrast images from Keck and um, Gemini. And so it's so it's a, it's a long pro progress. It's a long process <laughs> to take to go from finding um, these signals and validating the planet. But it did take an extra year of data. But but this is this is all data that was collected uh, between uh, launch in March of 2009 and uh, last May of 2013. Okay, thank you. Just one follow-up. What is the current status of Kepler Space Telescope? I know it's lost two of its gyros. Has the solar wind stabilization process worked? So, uh, but it, the, uh, the Kepler team has uh, developed a, uh, uh, an operation strategy for conducting science with the uh, Kepler spacecraft using two-wheel control. That uh, that mission concept was and and the science was was written up and submitted uh, as a proposal as part of NASA's senior review process. And the senior review process is is basically a uh, uh, the process that we use at NASA uh, to have the science uh, of our missions in their extended phase evaluated by a panel of external experts, and we get their recommendations about how best to invest the resources that we have for continued operation of our missions to get the best science bang for the buck, if you will. The, uh, the review has actually taken place uh, of the various proposals from all of our extended missions, and we're currently waiting for the final report from that committee. And over the next month or two, we'll be making decisions uh, about uh, the, uh, whether or not we'll continue and move forward with this uh, so-called K2 mission, if you will, the Kepler two-wheel mission, uh, as well as all of our extended missions. So we're, uh, we're in the process of deciding whether we will continue uh, operations with the mission, and, uh, uh, and so we will find out uh, within the next month or two. Very good. Thank you very much. Today's next question is from Ms. Elizabeth Fuller-Wright of Christian Science Monitor. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Uh, early on you mentioned that 3,800 potential planets had been identified by Kepler and that 950 or so were recently verified. 
I was curious about the status of the others. Are they still awaiting verification, or have some number been officially disqualified as not planets? Thank you. Yeah, I can touch upon this. This is Tom. No, um, those are the planet candidates. They don't include the false positives. There are the number of planet false positives um, that we identify increases and we, we re remove them from the list, but then we find more planets and the list increases. And we tend to find many more planets than we find false positives to exclude. Um, so that's the number of the, the, the candidates. Many of those we will be trying to validate, confirm, um, but it's a very long process. And um, we know of many, many planets. Some of them are more interesting than others. Some of them we want to spend time and resources on. Perhaps others we don't want to spend as much resources on. So, so it's a... I think you'll find more validation and more confirmation of the perhaps smaller, longer orbital period planets. This is uh, JD. We're going to go to, uh, I have two Twitter questions here. Uh, the first from Brian Ferguson. Uh, he asks, now that we know the location of some, some potentially habitable planets, is our search for intelligent life now a little more focused? Um, I can take that one. Um, so um, the SETI Institute has indeed been um, observing this star um, only because, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the inner few planets were detected early on. Um, so, um, so SETI has been monitoring it. Um, when we found Kepler 186f, um, they they upped their efforts and and were trying to get uh, a cover a full spectrum, and uh, and and yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, another question from Jean Makuka. Uh, was it a surprise to see an Earth-like planet around a red dwarf star and not a G25 like our own sun? Uh, yeah, so this, this touches upon some of the stuff I was saying. Uh, it's actually easier to find Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of M dwarfs because the transit depth is deeper, so we see a stronger signal. Um, our, our, our data we observe is noisy, and the deeper the signal, the, the more it stands out from the noise. We also see more transits in a given space of time. So for Earth, during the entire Kepler mission, we might see four transits um, if, we, if we were fortunate. Um, for this one, we might see up to ten transits in the same space of time. So it's, you see more transits, you see deeper transits, so it's easier to detect them around this kind, kind type of star. Okay, and once again, for uh, the folks on the telephone bridge, if you'd like to ask a question, push the star one key. Uh, one more question from Twitter real quick. Um, here's one. Um, Wilm van Odenhoef, uh, what are the odds that gas giants and other super-Earths in the habitable zone of stars have habitable moons? I guess I can take that one. Um, again, there's, there's no reason why gas giants uh, couldn't potentially have habitable moons. Um, Sometimes those habitable moons might be subjected to tidal heating, that, that same uh, thing I uh, described for uh, a close-in uh, planet around a star. So there are some different factors that also affect the habitability of moons, but there's no reason why they could not have a habitable moon. However, detecting such a thing I think would be quite difficult, but I could maybe hand over to Tom for that if you have any comments on detectability of habitable moons around Jovians in habitable zones. Um, other than saying there is lots of effort and people are doing putting fantastic work into trying to detect exomoons. It's really a br very hard thing to do, and people are trying very hard, and they're making great progress. As far as I know, there aren't any yet, but um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me too much if people were able to pull the signals out of the data. All right. Once again, uh, star one, if you have a question on the telephone bridge. Uh, Vance Mack is asking how many M dwarf stars are nearer to us than Kepler-186. Do we know? Um, other than it being a huge number, Kepler-186 is around about 500 light years away. In the nearest around about 100 light years, there are hundreds and hundreds of M dwarfs. So it's going to be a huge number. Um, in fact, we probably don't know of all the M dwarfs within that, that volume. All right, we have one on the telephone bridge. Millicent, can you introduce? Absolutely. We've received another question from Mr. Edward Downs of In Flight USA magazine. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you for accepting a second question. 
it's my understanding that uh, NASA is running a program online encouraging amateur astronomers to assist in analyzing some of the Kepler data. data. Am I correct in that understanding? Uh, this is uh, J.D. Harrington. Uh, that is a third-party uh, organization that's running that contest. NASA has no affiliation with that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and once again, we'll wait to see if any other uh, folks chime in for uh, fo uh, questions from the phone line. We've received another question from Ms. Shannon Hall of Science Telescope Magazine. Your line is now open. Hi, yes, that was actually Guy and Telescope Magazine. I am just curious if we're planning on doing follow-up observations to really get this exoplanet's mass. Um, I can take that. So um, uh, Kepler-186 is um, too faint for uh, radi radial velocity surveys. Um, also, the planets in the system are too small to you know, induce that uh, gravitational wobble that you, ne that you need to see for these Doppler um, surveys. So um, we didn't uh, commission these surveys to observe the star. Um, the other method of trying to constrain their masses would be through um, looking for um, uh, transit timing variations, and that's where you um, you look at the uh, period of every planet and see if, uh, if it's regular, if, if you could tell if there's another um, planet nearby tugging on it and, and altering their times. Um, w uh, once again, with this, these planets are too small, and so at the moment, we only know of uh, the size for Kepler-186f. Okay, I do have a follow-up. So how close would planets of this size have to be to Earth to get their mass, or is that just impossible? So I can touch, yeah. Th this size planets is possible, um, but you'd want a much brighter star. So if we talk, you know, magnitudes, this is about 14, and you want something brighter than 10, probably. And so if you, five magnitudes is, is a factor of 100 brighter. So that's about you probably want about 100 times brighter. Thank you. Our next question is from Ms. Adrienne LaFrance of The Atlantic. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was curious, this is probably a question for Elisa, but if you can talk just a little bit about, as you guys are trying to, to try to look for signs of life on other planets, what would that likely look like or sound like to scientists? Like, can you sort of describe in basic terms what exactly the, the signals you're looking for? That's a good question. I think that's a good question. Better answer that. Okay. Okay, well, um, so, so I guess you're talking about things or radio signals and maybe some kind of startup. so much more towards the red, um, we would expect that, in fact, uh, we'd be looking for photosynthesis at redder wavelengths because there's just more light coming in there. Um, so we can use a bunch of rules from photosynthesis on Earth and say, well, maybe the vegetation on this particular planet would be more sort of orange-yellow rather than, than green uh, because it would mm. use different wavelengths for light. Uh, so, so we can start to think about, you know, for this environment and for the light coming from the star, the sort of things we'd like to look for. 
Great, and, and one follow-up question on that. Um, given the, the redder wavelengths of light, is there a way to tell the degree to which it would appear red? Like, are we talking like a red light bulb in a, in a small room, or is it just kind of a sunsetty type glow, or, or how would you visualize that in Earth terms? Oh, um, that's tough. I mean, look, looking at just, the, I don't actually have a spectrum of the star, but I have a black body, which would approximate it, but not very well for an M dwarf. Um, but roughly, it gives out sort of half half of its radiation shortward of one micron, which is kind of the boundary between what astronomers call visible and infrared, comes from the star, and the other half is in the infrared. So there'd be a large amount of um, stuff coming from the infrared. So if you could see in the infrared, you would you would see the, the star more brightly. Um, but for us, there'd be... Really, yeah, a, a very dim reddish glow, I guess. I, I can't, so, uh, can't really this is Tom, visualize that, unfortunately. This is Tom, I can touch on this. We've, we work, we've worked on this. To, to our eyes, this star would actually would appear more of a, a whitey-orange color. It's not going to be a very deep red, like, um, you know, like a red light bulb. Um, mm. um, and this is because it's a fairly hot, uh, mm. hot for an M dwarf. So it's definitely more of an orange than a, than a red. Thank you. Be great. Thanks, Thanks Tom. All right, I think we've got time for one more, and it's going to come from the Twitter sphere. Um, we mentioned this planet is 1.1 times the size of Earth. Why is this size so much more important than, say, a 1.4 radius planet? Um, I guess I can take that. Um, so, so about a year ago, um, we had announced Kepler uh, 62F. Um, that planet was 40% larger, and it orbited in its star's habitable zone. So at that time, we were really excited, you know, super Earth and the habitable zone. Um, from, the time, uh, from that time up until now, um, we know so much more about um, the uh, sizes and masses of, of these um, sort of small bodies. Um, we have, uh, um, we have new, some thermal evolution models, um, which suggest that planets um, that are as small as Kepler-186 are highly unlikely to, to be to have a thick gas envelope, um, sort of like Neptune and, and the giant planets in our system. Um, Jeff Marcy put out a paper where he, where he analyzed uh, 45 small planets, uh, where he had be measured radius and measured mass, so you had the composition, um, and then trying to find, then he um, did a mass radius relation, and from that, it's, um, we can also deduce that planets as small as Kepler uh, 186f, um, the the probability of this planet of being rocky um, increases as you get to these smaller bodies. And also, um, we we only have Earth in our solar system. We don't have super Earths in our solar system. Um, we know of Earth and and we know of Venus, which is 95 percent the size of Earth. Um, we know that these it, that, that these planets are are, are sort of rocky. Um, planets that are like Kepler 62f that are 40 percent times larger um, than than our planet um, has you know has a, a larger amount of mass as well and we don't have we don't have any constraints on these super earth planets um, we don't know much about them uh, what we do know is that earth size planets um, um, have the right conditions for uh, for life to evolve Thanks, Elisa. And that's going to have to do it for today's news telecon. I'd like to thank our panelists and our operator, Millicent, for their time today. I ask that the panelists stay online for a few minutes for post-follow-up. For our listeners, our panelists will stay behind and answer any questions remaining on Twitter, Twitter's hashtag AskNASA forum. And if you join this telecon late, you can listen to it again by dialing 888.